some pictures of you and uh, praying for people on Facebook. And uh, I think it's, I think it's awesome what you're doing. I, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm thrilled to be a part of it. So some of my uh, um, good friends from Periscope are on. So you guys might've heard some of this, but I'm going to go a little more in detail. What, what do you think in terms of times, Con, time, Conrad, do I have? Well, I'm going to tell you what, I'm supposed to do a, uh, a Bible study at seven, but who cares? If, <laughs> we'll just keep going. If we go longer than that, what if Susan, Susan's giving you some, uh, she was, oh. my wife's in here. All right. Yeah, yeah, so there she is. She's got the red hair up there. But anyway, oh, we, we do a, we do a Bible study on Mondays, but we're both we'd both rather hear your testimony, rather hear your testimony. So that's great. Well, I will. Uh, I'll, <laughs> I've uh, negotiated with my beautiful wife. She's given me around an hour, so I'm gonna I'm gonna go. I'll try to take I'll try to take less time and then open it up for questions. If anybody has any questions, or, or if you want to you want to pry in a little bit, that'd be great. Amen. Let's pray in before we start. Amen. Okay. Amen. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this technology, Lord, that we can bring your presence, your word. And Lord, I love, I love that scripture that you over, we overcome by the blood of the lamb, by the word of our testimony, Lord. May this testimony touch people's lives and may people go, you know, that we're in certain bondages. May the words pour from your throne room down through Lucas's mouth to unlock these problems that people may have had before, you know, that they're having with encountering God and, and learning of God. But we pray that our tongues are a pen of a ready writer and uh, just bless us. Just bless this interview in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Sometimes, no, sometimes I stumble a little bit in prayer, man, but you know, if I keep going, then it gets all anointed and I'm like, woo, off to the races. I love it, praying. I love praying for people. I love it. And, and I know our father loves it. And he loves our, he loves our stumbles, you know, you know, Conrad, what, what is so cool just to share uh, this with you is the word that I received twice today. I'll show, tell you both ways that that showed up was the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. And that that was twice today and, and it hadn't been for months. So just so, just so you know, there's a confirmation right there. I woke up with that uh, with a song um, in my head that was. Blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. I forget uh, I forget the, the melody, but I, that was in my head waking up. And then, then I was drawn to that scripture immediately in one of my Bible apps. And uh, my, my, my daily uh, reading for the day was from Revelation from when, he's, when, he, when he says that. So, And then now you say it, it's like the Lord is, is so good to confirm. Okay, so without further ado, I'm going to go as... Uh, thoroughly through my, uh, my conversion and my, my road to, to Christ. And if at any time you want to stop me, man, just feel free. No worries. Just to uh, poke in and ask questions. Well, I was born in, uh, with, within an atheistic household. And what I mean by that to define terms is so important by atheism. I mean, people who would have proclaimed or would have self identified uh, as someone who who claims God doesn't exist, so they were highly skeptical. My mom would have been someone just to give you an idea about what she was like. She would have been someone who mocked someone of faith, who would have said that they were closed-minded, that they weren't open, that they that they were the that that religion was a crutch in their life that helped them feel better about uh, maybe death or about meaning or something like that. Um, okay, so that puts it in perspective, sort of where I what I was born into. I was also born into a war, uh, not in j just the spiritual sense, which is true, but also manifesting in the family. And my dad and my mom were aggressively fighting uh, when, since, I was, since I could remember. So my very first memories of my dad was someone who was really uh, scary, who I didn't want to be near, um, maybe who's somebody who lashed out in anger against me, but also ultimately was hurting my mom physically. So they were and, and, and she would start some of the fights. It wasn't, you know, now that I'm older and I understand, I'm not, I'm not just placing the blame on him. They were both in, with, uh, in the center of a really destructive and violent relationship. So that's where I was born into was this really chaotic uh, family life. My first memories were me and my brother being really scared and wanting my dad to leave because we, we thought that that meant peace because uh, when my dad was around, He'd come home from work, for instance, 
then the fighting would start. So in our small minds, our ability to understand what this meant was dad was the source of the problem. And if we could get him out, right, if he wasn't in the picture anymore, that was going to be a good thing for us. My brother is three years older than me. So he understood maybe a little better uh, at the time than, than I did. But I was in my five-year-old mind, it just, it seemed like a really good thing for them to get a divorce. Well, they did get a divorce, but it was a very violent divorce. Um, it was a very manipulative divorce. What that looked like in my home was mom was trying to get us to hate dad and dad was trying to get us taken away from mom through child services. And it w- it led to a, it led to a really confusing childhood where you didn't know where your allegiance was supposed to be. You know, as a child, you have this natural allegiance to both parents. You want both parents to be like, it's in you, right? It's written in you. But, uh, but in your experience over and over again, at least for me, it was really confusing. There was a conflict there. Why, um, why were we in this fight? Why could we not have both was the question often pinging around in my brain. Well, my mom and my dad both remarried almost instantly. Uh, My dad left the state, went really far away to Colorado. We were living in Florida. And my mom remarried a uh, Israeli. He is uh, uh, still my stepdad to this day. His name is Avi, coming from the Avraham, like the father of our faith, but the Hebrew pronunciation with a V there. And Avi was a is um, he's a really interesting man, and I have so much respect and love for him. Uh, but to give you some context, where he came from, English was his second language. Didn't know it really well. It was a frustrating thing in his life to try to com- communication was a frustrating thing. Uh, added to that frustration is he came out of uh, IDF, which in Israel, when you're 18, you're going to fight no matter what, because you've been at war since 1948. It's just part of life for the Israeli. You're always in a war zone and you fight. That's just who they are. Um, and it was no different for Avi. So Avi grew up in a really hostile environment with really uh, traumatic life experiences. And he was an engineer in the tanks um, involved in wars, active war. And uh, a lot of times he'd be woken up to gunfire and he witnessed people die in front of him. Friends of his that he knew were, were destroyed in front of him. So this is the sort of environment he was growing up in. And spiritually, a lot of doors were open. Now we in the West with our, uh, psychology and you know our uh, our rational our rationalization of everything we we have described this as maybe post traumatic stress disorder, which I believe it's a spiritual root. It's a it's a demonic uh, influence. But what it, what that meant for us growing up, this is all significant because what it meant in my life was every now and then Avi would be frustrated. He'd be uh, something in the maybe communication or something was frustrating him, and he would turn like turn off. And basically everything would go red in his mind. He would lose control of his body and he would destroy everything in the house. Like everything that was around him, like a bull in a china shop, he would just freak out. So again, as a kid, as a six-year-old, what this meant is that I just thought that I was going to die all the time. I lived in a constant state of fear. And I uh, honestly just thought, you know, there were several times where he would like drive his car through the garage door or he'd break the fish tank in the computer and the TV, things that were like, It was so devastating as a kid. We just thought we're going to, we're dead. You know, this is over. What's so uh, cool about now that now looking back on my life is Abby never touched us physically. That's really important. I want to, he had something in him that, that uh, it was the grace of God in our lives that preserved us and protected us, even though he couldn't really control himself. And we, we knew that about Abby when he lost control, it wasn't him anymore. Something else took over. And uh, for those of you who have just have experienced post-traumatic stress disorder, this might this, this might sound familiar, um, but rage is one manifestation of that. And that's what I would describe this as. So, okay. So zoom ahead a few years. This, this was my, this was my uh, family life as a young man and God was never talked about. Prayer was never a reality. You know, uh, again, what I, my, the, the philosophical influence from my mom was that those religious people are all total quacks and they've all drank the Kool-Aid and they're all brainwashed. And uh, a real honorable person would reject any kind of mind disease like religion or faith or belief in a God. So this was sort of the place I came from. Um, I grew up with a 
a very intense distrust for authority. So if an adult were to say to me, don't do, don't smoke marijuana, my little brain said, that's exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to figure out what the adults are hiding from us. Right. And, uh, when I was 12 years old, I started smoking pot every single day as a, as a seventh grader, sixth grader. Um, by seventh grade, I was trying my old, I had an older brother in high school. So he was, uh, you know, he was, uh, exposed to more hard, intense drugs and he delivered those to, to me. And uh, so by seventh grade, I was doing ecstasy by, uh, by high school. I had found psychedelics, a lot of LSD, things like that. Um, basically anything I could get my hands on that offered a short term, a feeling of euphoria, I would, I would do that. Um, I developed a relationship with marijuana such that it was literally every day, all day, just basically staying, um, staying high. And then I discovered women in, uh, well, early in middle school, but it really, it really got out of control in high school where I discovered the, uh, uh, the rush of, man, of manipulation. And basically I played something that is well-developed and I'm not, I'm not suggesting you guys go look this up, but it is out there. It's called the game. Now I didn't realize I was involved in this. Like I wouldn't have used the same language when I was an eighth grader, but this is exactly looking back on it. This is exactly what I did. And what the game looks like is something like this. You walk into a room you find the prettiest girl in the room. Uh, you learn about her insecurities and you attack those. You use a basically emotional warfare and you manipulate to get what you want out of people. And it also works for relationships with men. Um, but, uh, but, you know, people of uh, the world who don't know who they are, they're very easily manipulated based on their insecurities. Why, why, one, one reason the Christian is free is that we know who we are and our identity doesn't come from uh, what people think about us or what, or what the, the world says about us. So, but people that are outside of Christ, so much of their identity is wrapped up in uh, social um, acceptance, popularity, you know, the, the fear of man, you can, you can uh, play off of these things anyway. So I discovered this you know, as a, as a high schooler. And I started to just do this basically in all my relationships. So I would, uh, I, I quickly became popular at high school, you know, winning the prom, uh, pr uh, junior prom and things like that. Like that's who I was. I was someone who everyone looked at and said, Oh, he's cool. He's got it all together. He's got a great life, had a lot of friends, always had a pretty girlfriend. So very quickly I was, I was gaming the, the, the system, or at least I thought I was right. I, I had suppressed the truth about God for so long that I really thought that I was my own God and I manipulated the world such uh, to be consistent with that. I, I want to stop you right there for a second. Yeah. Suppressing the truth. I don't know if that speaks a lot right there. What do you mean by suppressing the truth? Absolutely. So um, I, I, I started my testimony with, a, with an event where my stepdad would, uh, would lose control. And I'm going to come back to that later, um, but it's going to it's going to demonstrate this fact right. from the word of God, what the word of God says about the 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 reality of our relationship with God, because if an atheist claims uh, I don't believe in God, well, we would be making a huge mistake to believe them. So we're going to that's an awesome question. It's, it's really this is really the heart of my uh, evangelism is is bringing to attention the things that we all really do deeply hold is true, whether we have, uh, whether we can consciously admit it because it's still up in our mind or whether we've suppressed it for so long that we've actually deceived ourselves into believing a lie. Um, so I'll, I'm going to get back to that. So remember that, that, um, that those moments of intense fear and, uh, uh, basically when I thought I was going to die, I'm going to use that later to demonstrate this fact that I've been suppressing the truth. Now, if you would have asked me when I was 18, are you suppressing the truth? I would have said, no, God doesn't exist. It's obvious. All the evidence points to atheism, right? Not, not that I had ever done a single experiment, not that I had ever searched out the arguments. I came into the, to the discussion. I already knew what was true, right? I already knew atheism was true without ever really considering data or any, any, uh, any evidence. So it wasn't that. Now I look back and I say, I honestly never did objective science. And I, I challenge atheists to, to observe their own pursuit of truth. 
is that what you're doing? Did you go out just completely neutral and say, you know, here, here's all this data. What does it point to? Or did you go in the courtroom with the verdict in your back pocket? Did you already know what conclusion you wanted to reach and you twisted the data to fit that worldview? And that, that was me. I mean, I, I would I would tell people that I did objective science, that I just let the data lead me. You know, I would tell people that. But but the truth was much different. So by uh, so I'll, I'll definitely get back to that, Conrad. Great question. By uh, by the end of high school, I had, uh, you know, basically in the world's eyes, I was uh, successful, you know, getting good grades. School came pretty easy to me maintaining, uh, you know, exteriorly good relationships. My parents thought I was a pretty good guy. Uh, all the kids in school thought I was pretty cool. I was able to like get away with everything I wanted to. I was pretty good at fooling the adults. So no one, no one suspected me of being addicted to every drug under the sun and uh, living this really destructive lifestyle. I was able to paint two pictures of myself pretty successfully. I was able to convince the adults and the powers that be that, hey, I'm actually a pretty responsible dude. Uh, but at the same time, I was living this really destructive lifestyle in the dark. And uh, by college, this really manifested fully because now I'm 300 miles away from mom and dad, away from uh, the, the authorities that were in my life, whether, you know, like soccer coaches and things like that. Now I'm just off in a place where partying is like the most important thing you can do where seeing how many games of beer pong you can win is like the coolest expression of who you are. And so basically I went from a place where I had to really convince people to try sin to a place now where they came in order to sin. And I was sort of just, I just uh, let them, right. I just, I just let them uh, develop what they already wanted to do. Uh, I guided them in that I was a teacher of sin. Right? I said, Oh, you think you know how to have fun? hold on, let me show you. Let me show you this drug. Let me show you this drug. I've introduced dozens and dozens of people to, to substance that probably destroyed their life. Um, uh, that definitely destroyed their life. And by, by the, the time my junior year in college rolled around, I had basically tried everything that I knew to be happy, to be, uh, to be, to be at peace, um, whether it was making money. You know, I started, I was an entrepreneur, so I kept starting a lot of businesses and, and earning cash, uh, whether it was girls. Again, I always had a girlfriend. I always stayed fulfilled in that way, or at least I thought I was um, by having a pretty girlfriend around. And uh, I was selling drugs. So, I, you know, making a lot of money in that way. And that provided an avenue for drugs, easy access to that, to that network. Um, so all the things that the rap songs promised me, right? I grew up without a dad. So my, 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 the, the, the identity came from like Snoop Dogg and Dr. Dre and all the stuff I filled my life with, right? You know, just, I believed all that stuff. I believed 50 Cent. I believed the, the, uh, the lie that once you get all the ladies and the booze and the drugs and the money, then you've arrived, then you're, then you're set, you know? And, uh, which is really the American dream. Just, uh, that, that's the idea. It's the myth that, you know, all these things are going to fill you. Right. Um, and so I found myself in college with all those things. And it was actually in the, in a few of the moments where I really had realized that, like I, when I say realized it, like I had gathered, it manifested in my life, the, the women, the money, the drugs, the popularity, the power, you know, I was controlling several people under me selling drugs so that I had this idea of like power or authority. Um, you know, people running my errands for me, people buy, you know, all this stuff. It was in those moments where I actually looked around and I was the most lonely that I'd ever been. It was in those moments where I realized how dark that existence really is, um, how all of my relationships that I had built were, uh, were based on manipulation and fear and insecurities. So I didn't really know anybody. And the scriptures say, if you walk in the light, then you can have fellowship. And it implies that if you're not in the light, you cannot have true fellowship. This is in the first John. He's talk, John's describing this principle. And I've experienced that. You know, you, you make all of these uh, relational friendships in the world, but they're all based on, if they're not based in Christ, they're based on something else. And that something else can change. It's fickle. It's fleeting. 
So I had a lot of relationships based on drugs, like chemical romances. Well, I knew that once the drugs ran out, those relationships would run out. I had a lot of relationships based on money, like economic relationships. Well, once the uh, right most radical man just uh, just posted it, praise God. Oh, that's you. <laughs> nice. Uh, once uh, once the money ran out, that relationship would run out. Right. I had all these relationships based on something besides the solid rock of foundation uh, of our our solid foundation, the rock of salvation. I had all these relationships built on this stuff that was going away. And what that led to was this loneliness and this despair. It was utter despair. So around the end of my junior year, going into my senior year, I started to try to kill myself with substance. Now, again, if you would have asked me this, hey, are you trying to kill yourself? I probably would have said no, but I was a coward. I wasn't brave enough just to pick up a gun and do it. I was a coward. I was trying to do it through substance. So every week I'd you know, be funneling liquor or doing more and more drugs, more and more substance, because I was hoping that I would just cash out without ever having to answer for my life. Right? I didn't want to feel death. So I wanted to just numb myself out of it. So I, uh, this is where I was at in my senior year. And the relationship that I was in, just so you guys know, I, I started, a, I met a guy named Sam. And uh, Sam, worked at the college with me. We were economics tutors for one of the big classes. And I saw Sam, I saw this guy. He was really brilliant. You know, he's a certified genius in terms of his IQ. He's really, really smart. He's really talented. Um, Everything he touched, he did really well. He worked with all of his heart. But what really freaked me out about Sam was that he didn't, he was humble, you know, and he didn't, he didn't seem to need to manipulate me or to uh, he, he just didn't operate in the wisdom of the world. And I, it was the first time I ever, ever really was close to somebody like that. And uh, so I started to, to grow in my relationship with Sam and seek him out. And now to be, to be uh, transparent with you guys, I was actually trying to find him out. I was trying to, to show that he was a fraud. I didn't believe that he could really be like that. I thought he was just really good at wearing a mask. Right. I was like, I know I wear a mask, so you must just be really good at wearing your mask. And I want to find that. Out. I want to I want to I want to see that deep down. You're just like me. Well, the closer I got to him, uh, the more I uh, the, the Holy Spirit ministered to me through Sam. And I, I say it like this now. This is kind of a beautiful way to say it. But I uh, I, I uh, this is true. Um, I was prepared to argue with someone who knew about God. But I never anticipated meeting someone who knew God. And I was not prepared for that. And argumentation and apologetics and all the discussion, they were really important. The reason they were important is not because I needed good reasons or, you know, not because it was because it provided a space for me to meet Jesus Christ through Sam over and over and over again. Uh, it was less his actual answer and it was his peace that was ministering to me. So guys, good answers are important. Reasoning is important. Phil phil philosophy, biology, all of the, that stuff is important, but never forget that the true ministry that's happening is the peace that surpasses all understanding that is alive on the inside of you, that you have the spirit of Christ. And that, that is a, a is when Paul says, I didn't come with fine sounding arguments, but with the spirit and the demonstration of the spirit's power, I came in power and in a demonstration of the Holy Spirit. When he's talking about that, he's, he's talking about the, the inner Christ that's alive in you that comes and ministers. It breaks down it break. It, it passes intellectual barriers and it goes after the heart. So sorry, getting off a tangent, but this is what my relationship with Sam was like. I'd basically argue, mock, poke fun at him, tell him why he was an idiot, tell him why he was brain, you know, deluded and, and brainwashed. And he would just very humbly and gently provide answers, maybe ask a couple tough questions that I didn't wasn't prepared to answer. Um, I found myself, uh, yeah, amen. I, I found myself not um, not living consistently with my own worldview, and that caused frustration. Here I was telling Sam that he was wrong that he was Christianity was wrong or evil even is what I would say sometimes. But my worldview said that those things couldn't exist, that it was all an illusion that we were just determined, uh, you know, that I was a philosophical naturalist. So I would, I would deny God's existence. But if by doing that, 
what you're doing is you're denying moral absolutes at the same time. You can't have you can't have that. For an atheist that denies uh, the existence of God, you're you might not realize it, but you're also throwing throwing out absolute truth and morality. And it takes a few tough philosophical questions to to illustrate that to you. And Sam Sam provided me with that with that conversation. Okay, so this is senior year in college. Sam is uh, sharing the gospel with me, and for the first time, I'm really like considering uh, alternatives. And, um, at the same time, I'm in a very destructive relationship with a woman and that ended in abortion actually. So it was very destructive. The wages of sin is death. And I've experienced that firsthand, um, as a murderer, right. As somebody on the wrong side of that. And I, uh, saw this contrast between these two worlds where my relationship with my girlfriend at the time was highly manipulative constantly playing on each other's insecurities to feel security in the relationship, but there's, it's never really there, right? Because it's just, it's a, it's a, uh, it's darkness. But at the same time with Sam, I felt not judged. I felt loved. I felt like I could be myself. I felt like it was a safe place to ask questions, to, to be vulnerable, to, uh, to not feel like manipulated. So I had this contrast between the two worlds and I could see it pretty clearly. Uh, what I want to, do is do a little off offshoot. I'm going to zoom ahead of the future. My best friend at the time who I moved to college with, he was, we were in the same band together. We just, we toured, played tons of concerts together. Um, he was a gene. He was our valedictorian of my high school. He was a genius. Um, and we went into atheism together and drug and that whole culture together. Well, I want to just share this story just to show you guys how important worldviews are and, uh, how devastating wrong worldviews can be. Well, um, Sam, my friend and myself, we were always involved in these discussions. It was the three of us. And for months I was on my friend's side against Sam, right? And my friend was very intellectual. He was a microbiologist. He has a PhD in microbiology and he, he was a strict determinist. And for months I was with him against Sam, but the piece of Sam was ministering to me. I was just sheep. And the shepherd's voice was familiar. And I started to follow Jesus out of my, out of darkness. Now, what's, what's interesting, what I want to pull your guys' attention to is uh, what happened just two months ago. And that friend killed himself. He got to that point where he, 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 he swallowed a bullet. And I say that guys, because I was there with him when he made the choice to commit himself to darkness and reject truth. And the consequences of that is eventually God, he hands you over to that depraved mind, to that darkened mind. And man, I, it breaks my heart. I pray for this guy all the time. And I, and I just rely on the mercy of God. I'm not, I'm not hundred percent sure how all that works out, you know, but I trust God's mercy, but I just want to show you that it is worth it. You know, I, I think about um, at one point I bought the lie that I shouldn't minister the gospel to him anymore. I should just live it out. And hopefully he'll like what he sees and ask me about my faith. And I believe that lie and I stop sharing the gospel and I stop reasoning with him and I stop talking to him. Now I'm not carrying shame and guilt. Just, you know, the Lord has, uh, I know that I'm, I know that I'm loved in Christ, but I do want you to see how important it is. It is important to use your words as well. Actions are of course important. Um, but, reasoning and argumentation with Sam provided us a safe place for me to meet Jesus. And I'm so thankful for that. And after uh, my friend Braylon, after he committed suicide, I, uh, it just lit me on fire to share the gospel. Never again will I buy into that lie, right? Because it came from atheist mouth. They kept telling me, Hey, don't share the gospel, just live it out. And people will eventually ask you about it. Well, praise God that Jesus didn't do that. Praise God that the apostles didn't do that. Praise God that, yes, they lived it out. Of course they did. But they also preached in season and out of season. But they brought the word of God with them, spoken and, and lived out. So, so it was a small tangent, but I think it's really important, guys. Um, yeah, life and death are in the power of the tongue. Amen. Let me Amen. ask you this. It, it sounds like there's not – was there a defining point where you went, I'm all in with Jesus, or was it a struggle yeah. for a while? I mean, yeah, yeah. And, so, and, and can, can you can you kind of define to me, you, you're uh, talking a little bit about the spiritual tugging. 
of the Lord. It, it sounds like you have a, a battle between the spirit and the carnal mind, right? Absolutely, man. Okay. Great question. So this is this is uh, where I'll talk about specifically about conversion and what that looks like. This is what conversion is not. Conversion is not in your mind deciding Christianity is true. And that happens. I see that a lot where people think that are that you can argue yourself. You can reason your way to Christianity. Now, of course, Christianity is reasonable, but it's not the word of God describes the problem. And, and the, the solution is that God in his grace and mercy will grant you repentance, which means to change your mind that will lead to a knowledge of the truth. And faith itself is a gift of God. So this is what my conversion looked like, how that how the word of God is true in this way, in every way. But in, it's, it's uh, particularly in this way. I was hearing the gospel from Sam. I was seeing the gospel lived out. I started to realize that even though I could never believe, I honestly, in my mind, I could never believe the Bible. I could never believe the story about Jesus. I'm just being honest with you. I could never believe it. It was just ridiculous to me. It was foolishness to me. But I started to want what he had. So my, uh, I went to a church camp with him. I decided, you know, it was a retreat. It sounded like fun. There was going to be a lot of people there. I decided that I'd go. And I heard a man preach between the difference of religion and the gospel. And something about it spoke to my spirit. Now, again, I still, in my mind, I could not believe in Jesus. I could not believe in the Bible. It was all way too, it was way too ridiculous for me. But when he was preaching something in me, the Holy Spirit, now I know him at, personally, but at the time I didn't realize what, who he was, was in me saying, you can do this. Like you can believe in this. This is real, but it's your choice. And I, I for, for a moment, I became aware of the fact that all of us need to be aware of is that we choose what we believe in. We choose it. Now, if we choose to believe in in a lie for long enough, it becomes really hard to even uh, imagine the truth. We can really get caught up in that lie, but we have chosen to believe in the lie just as powerfully. We can choose to believe uh, in, in something else, or at least we can want the desire. And that's where I got with God is I started to see the gospel lived out. My first prayer uh, my first two prayers um, would change my life forever. First of all, I had I uh, I hadn't prayed it as, as an adult uh, ever. In fact, when Sam encouraged me to pray, I just like mocked that idea. Like that was the most disgraceful idea. That was such a uh, that was such a shameful act for a human to pray. Right? That's what I thought because the devil had convinced me. Right? The devil is against our worship in every way. He wants to stop. So when someone raises their hand at church, the devil hates that. The devil hates it when we give glory to God, when we worship him. Prayer is an act of worship, right? It's, it's, a, it's an important act of worship. And But Sam encouraged me to pray, and I just at first just rejected it. Like, that's ridiculous. I'll never lower myself to that humiliating posture, right, in my mind. This is what I'm thinking. But as I lay in bed at night, his words are bouncing off my skull. You know, just like, why not, Luke? What's wrong? Why, why won't you pray? So I decided to pray. And this is where my life changed forever. I uh, closed my eyes. I'm a you know 23 year old man at this point, a boy, but you know still uh, 23 years old. It's pitch black in my room, and there's nobody near me at all, right? So in my mind, I'm all by myself. So I I open my mouth, and this is like a really embarrassing prayer or whatever. You know, all of them are beautiful in God's eyes, but it was a really awkward prayer because I had not prayed. But this is what happened. And I hope that you guys catch this. It's so powerful. I said, God, if you're real, and before I could finish my sentence, two things happened. First, I became embarrassed. And the thought attached to that embarrassment was, hey, why are you embarrassed if you're all by yourself? Because embarrassment is a phenomenon that only happens in public. And then the next thought changed my life forever because you're not all by yourself and you never have been. And in a moment, I became utterly aware of the presence of God, of his awesome, patient, humble, meek, gentle presence that had been there the whole time. And it was like the lights turned on. Now I wasn't saved at this moment, by the way. Okay. I was, uh, just, it was like Isaiah and the temple. I was like, woe is me. I'm a man of unclean lips, right? I felt like I was going to be destroyed by the presence of a holy and perfect, intimate God who had seen every thought that I ever thought 
every word I had ever spoke, every lie, every manipulation, every sin, every time I blasphemed him and spit in Jesus's face, he was there patiently waiting with his arms wide open. So that was, that changed my life forever. And I decided I want it. I want it. So my next prayer was this guys, God, I need, I, I, I need faith. I can't believe this. I just spoke it just as plainly as I'm speaking it to you. I can't believe this, but I need faith. Give me faith. Help me to believe. Help my unbelief. Well, the Lord answered that prayer. And it wasn't an immediate thing where all all of a sudden, boom, like poof. Oh, I believe now. But slowly, as Sam spoke the gospel, I it made sense. It became like Jesus said, my words are spirit and they are life. And I became excited to hear it. I became uh, enthralled with it. I, I became like it was necessary for my survival. I needed to hear more. I needed it. And uh, then there was an altar call at my church and uh, Pastor Calvin, I'll never forget it. He, he said, if any, and I think altar calls are so important because they, they, uh, they provide a, a, a moment in history where you say, yes, this is me. I'm going to proclaim this before men. I'm going to confess Christ right now before people. And he said, if any of you guys want to uh, receive Christ, if the Holy Spirit's tugging at your heart, I want you to stand up. I want you to do something bold. I want you to stand up and move to the front. And it was just me. There was 500 people in the church or something, you know, a huge church in Gainesville. Amen. And I, I stood up and I was, I was uh, uh, weeping by the time I got to the front, but I didn't care at all. I was so, jo- I knew that I had, ex- I knew that I had responded to the call and I knew that he was so proud of me. And in that moment, I felt the words, well done. This is my son in whom I'm well pleased. This is my beloved son. And I knew that reality was mine. Uh, then this is a, uh, this gets really fun guys. So then uh, I was saved into a Baptist church and I love my Baptist brothers and sisters for all you guys out there. Praise God. God bless you guys. Um, my Baptist church was a bunch of really good people that loved God with all their heart and, uh, and uh, God loved them. And they had a, love for the word of God. And they, and, and, and they instilled in me a love for the word of God. And I really uh, appreciate them. I appreciate, I appreciate the body of Christ manifesting in that way. Um, but also there was something in me that wanted to see and to experience uh, the manifestation of, of the power of God that I saw in the scriptures. Uh, and I'm not saying that doesn't exist anywhere in the Baptist church. It probably does all over the place. In my experience, I didn't, I didn't see that part of it. I didn't see like healings or miracles or um, uh, speaking in tongues. I didn't see that part of uh, the kingdom of God. But the more I read Acts and the more I read the uh, the gospels, I wanted it. You know, I wanted it. The more I read Corinthians, I, I wanted, I just became addicted to the word of God. And I became convinced that, that it was real, that it was true for today. And it wasn't just a, at, a, at a time far past, but that this, this was a reality today. And so, uh, You know, the question is not whether miracles exist today. The question is, how bad do you want to find out? You know, and if you want to find out, you're going to find out some some stuff that's going to shake your foundation. If you're here today and you think that miracles are uh, just for the past, I'm here to tell you that is that is bogus. And if you really want to know, again, it's not whether they exist. It's how bad do you want to find out? And if you open that can, man, it's going to change your life forever. But you will find out. I have a testimonies label on my blog, which it's what I do is get people's to, miracles. Come Miracle. Blog. But you're not, if you close your eyes, you'll never, you know, you'll never, you'll never find. Find. yeah, you got to right. see only seekers find man. Only seekers find. And you gotta, you gotta um, be open to that. So, so this is where I was. I, uh, okay. So at this time I made a, I mean, I was saved. It was Gainesville, Florida, university of Florida graduate. And uh, I made a, a crucial mistake in the faith at this time. I was so zealous, man. I mean, for me, by the way, going to Jesus Christ, uh, like accepting uh, uh, the the work of salvation on the cross, what that meant for me was to lose my family. Now, that wasn't actually true, but in my mind, that's what it meant. It meant that my family would disown me. In fact, my mom, one of the first things she said to me is, you drunk the Kool-Aid. She was so disappointed in me. She was so disappointed in my decision. Like it, it broke her heart that I went to G- that I, that I, that I came to Christ. So for me, what that meant, I mean, honestly, I had to count the cost of following Jesus and it wasn't a really quick decision. It was several weeks of like imagining my life without my family that I'd never speak to them again. This is what, this is what following Christ for me is what it meant. Um, now praise God. He gave me back my family even even better. And it's amazing what's happening in my family, the salvations that have happened. I mean, just awesome stuff, but I'm getting ahead of myself. So, uh, 
So here I was on fire for the Lord. I'm calling everybody in my phone book. Now, get, now, just to put it in perspective, I had one Christian friend and I had about a thousand drug dealer, you know, you, you name it, people of the world that were living openly for the world. This was my, this was my world. So basically what, what the first days of Christianity meant was people either immediately rejecting me, just kind of laughing me off, like you're going through a phase, you know, you'll be back soon, you know, whatever. Um, but a lot of friendships just ended immediately because I came to them with the love of Christ and the gospel so passionately. And they were just like, I don't want to have anything to do with that. And uh, it ended a lot of relationships. Well, like I told you guys, my brother, my big brother, I think in the world, me and him were so close to each other. We had gone through hell together. We had gone through this really traumatic childhood together. We had been living together in college for about five years. I just loved my brother, Matt, uh, and I wanted him to, to receive salvation. Um, I had two experiences on drugs right before salvation, encounters with God. Um, that you got, you know, th this, this kind of gets weird, but I'm going to go ahead and share it because why not just unpack it all. But one of the encounters was I hadn't, uh, I hadn't done LSD in a really long time. And a friend of my brothers and I's, he, uh, he came over to the house and said, Hey guys, I have this. It's really good. I've done it before, which is rare in that in drug and drug culture. A lot of times you're kind of guessing, uh, you, you, you don't know what you're putting in your body. Um, anyway, we had a personal testimony. Here's this guy saying, this is really good. Let's do it. And now at this point, keep in mind, I had already heard the gospel for months. I was in a really destructive relationship with a female, but I was really starting to see in Sam something that I wanted. Hey, what's up, boss? And um, so we do this LSD. Now, after, after we're uh, tripping is what it's called, right? You're sort of basically during an acid trip, and I'm not, I'm not promoting drugs on here, and I'm not certainly not saying anything about uh, how cool it was that I did drugs. I just want you guys to know me and to know where I came from uh, and to know the old me that's dead and nailed on a cross. I want you to see that transformation for the glory of God. What happens is your conscience mind, this is the best way I can describe it, is it turns around and it lives in your subconscious for several hours, maybe several days. Uh, tune in, drop in, drop out, right? There's like these uh, Timothy Leary called it the, the God drug, where you're, it feels like you're really aware of reality on a dimension that you weren't before. Uh, what I would say is you're, you are very aware of the spiritual realm, but it's not the light side of the spiritual realm. Now the, now the devil comes as an angel, tune in, yeah, turn on, tune in and drop out. Yeah, you got it. Exactly. Sorry, I might have, I might have uh, botched that. The, the devil comes as an angel of light. So, of course, in these trips, you are tempted to worship what you're seeing and experiencing because they are on a higher level, in a sense, in terms of power and manifestation. They're on a higher level and we are tempted to worship them. So in this space, I'm uh, tripping. And by the way, in an acid trip, it's you can't really control if you're going to be sober or not you sort of lose control in that sense, which is why they say it's really important that you make sure you're in a place that's safe with friends that'll take care of you. Like people who do acid spend a lot of time preparing their environment before time so that they won't get really in trouble. Like it won't turn into a bad trip is what people call it. So you take all these precautions before time to make sure that you're going to be safe. Okay. So I'm going on this tangent. For those of you who will understand what I'm saying, I think, I think you're going to find it to the glory of God, just amazing. Anyway, I'm in this uh, trip and the, and the guy who gave us the drug turned to me and in the moment, in the, in the, in the trip, he manifested as a demonic spirit, which of course the demonic spirit was moving on him. And I was seeing in the spirit and he turned to me and my brother and he said, do you trust me? It's really strange. You know, we're sitting there and all of a sudden he just goes, do you trust me? And my brother and I go, yes. And he said, follow me. And then we left the house. We went to a movie theater not to watch a movie, but to watch people watching the movies. I'll never forget it. It was the, uh, I walk into a movie called the, the Curious Case of Benjamin Button. It was a Brad Pitt movie. And we were just standing in the front of the movie theater watching people watch the movie. And in a moment, I started to become aware again, 
a, a foreshadowing to that prayer I had in my room, which happened later. I started to become aware of the spiritual realm and just the, the, the powers of darkness and how, how not fun the end of that road really is. Right. I started, it's like God in his mercy was showing me, Hey, if you, if you really, if you reject me, if you keep going, this is what hell is like. And it's not what people promise. It's like, it's really lonely. It's really scary. It's not a good, it's not a place that you are going to feel peace and love and joy. You know, the devil may have convinced you that it's a place where you'll be partying for the rest of your existence, but it's not. Um, so I sobered up immediately in the middle of this trip. Like I had an encounter with God. Fear overtook me. I, I tell you guys a story because the next day I told my brother, I couldn't just, I couldn't explain to him what had happened to me, but I told my brother, Hey Matt, we have to be really careful who we trust. And, uh, and after that day, Amen. <laughs> I, after that day for a solid year, I tried to clean myself up almost for a year. I tried to clean myself up and I stopped all drugs. I stopped hanging out with drug dealers. Now I hadn't accepted Christ yet. This was like all happening at the same time. I'm still talking to Sam. I'm about to go through an abortion. I am about to receive Christ soon. But for uh, almost a year, maybe eight months, I try to clean myself up and live righteously on my own, thinking that that would be like I'd be my own salvation. OK, this is why it's crucial about a, about. Yeah, like about eight months to a year later, another event happened. I'm with my brother again. And uh, some people start smoking marijuana and without, without missing a beat, I just grab it and smoke it. Now I haven't done a single drug in all these months. I had been completely sober, stone cold sober. Uh, but the moment I hit it, the spiritual came over me again in an overwhelming way. And the whole night was, uh, was this traumatic experience. But, the, but what was interesting about it is the only person that I could think of was Sam. And the safety that I knew about Sam. So it was like 12 o'clock at night and I kept calling Sam. Now, the next morning I woke up. He didn't answer. He couldn't answer the phone. It was 12. But I saw that I had done that. Um, and then that's when I decided then and there that I would, that I would go to Sam, humble myself and, and accept, and accept uh, the gospel. Um, wh why I tell you that is because right after I got saved, I had on my heart that my brother be saved too. And then I told you I made a, tra a tragic mistake. This is what the mistake was. I thought that I was going to save my brother. So when my brother said he's going to move to Boulder, Colorado and start a business, I said, this is my opportunity to save my brother. And I moved with my brother and one other man all the way to Colorado. And honestly, my heart was to, to be the light. To, to share the gospel with them, to save them. But the scriptures talk about being unevenly yoked. And this is the position I found myself in. And after six months of it, I was honestly trying to run again from Jesus. I was trying to rationalize everything that had happened to me. I was trying to deny the, the, the answered prayer, the, the experiences in prayer, the experiences on drugs. I was trying to deny all those things and rationalize them because I was, I was like trying to walk in the darkness again. I was back with girls and drugs and alcohol. But there was a difference. When I did the drugs, immediately I, I just, it, it, was, it was like I was going against who I was because I really had been born again. I really had a new heart and new desires. And I was trying to live according to the flesh. And I believe all those promises in scripture, like when, when Paul says in Romans 8, 1, when he says, now therefore there is no condemnation for those of us in Christ Jesus who walk by the spirit. When he says that, it's not, a, it's not a contingency about like you must walk by the spirit and then there'll be no condemnation. It's a promise about who you are. It's a promise about your new nature and what you'll be like. It's like the Ten Commandments. They used to be commandments. Now they're promises. You know, Jesus used to say, thou shalt not murder like you better not do this. Right now, Yahweh says you shall not murder. It's a promise. It's who you are. It's it, it's it's your identity. You become a fulfillment of the law in Christ. And that's what I was, even though I was trying to do drugs. Again. I was trying to run away. I was having my Jonah moment and I'm sprinting away from God, but he's just pulling me back. He's pulling me back. I, I'll never forget on New Year's Eve, 2011, I think it was, I'm out trying to get smashed, drunk with alcohol. And I, 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 I drank to the point of blacking out, like of, how, of like time traveling is what we called it. And all of a sudden I came to completely sober in an alleyway holding this homeless man crying. And I, and it was like Christ was in me. And I couldn't believe that these homeless people were going to sleep in the freezing cold in Colorado. And it's like, I just, I just, as, as hard as I try to run back to darkness, I was a child of the light. 
and he was faithful to finish the work that he started and, and to bring to completion. So it was like, no matter how hard I tried to run, he was pulling me back, reminding me who I was. Well, uh, zoom ahead a little bit. I visited Sam in Boston. And I knew immediately God, the Lord spoke to me and said, follow, come back to me. And now when I was going to Sam, by the way, I was planning on telling him how enlightened I had been in Boulder and how all of that stuff that he believes is ridiculous again. But in, the, in, in, a, in just a few hours of being in the presence of, of the people of God, all of that stuff went away. And I realized this is the truth. And it was, it was one of those moments like where Jesus asked Peter to leave his net and his boats and they just, they just leave. But he asked me to leave my business he asked me to leave my uh, friends and family in Boulder. And I just, I knew that I just had to obey. So I left without realizing, like without having everything figured out, without having everything together, I left Boulder and I went to Boston. Now the Lord is so good. By the time I got to Boston, he had opened all of these doors. He orchestrated it. And I walked into blessing. I walked into the blessing of God. Shortly after I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I met people who, uh, who operated in the gifts of the spirit. I, uh, I left religious Christianity, which was this constant attempt to obey the law. And I finally received the grace of God. Um, even though I was a Christian, I still lived. And for those, for those of you Christians that are listening right now, um, a trap for us Christians is to fall, fall into religion after we're saved. So that might look like we receive the gospel by grace. We receive the Holy Spirit by grace, but then we turn around and try to live by the law and, and, and we trust in our ability to obey the law. So we take our eyes off the cross. We take our eyes off Calvary and we put our eyes on ourselves and our obedience. Are we spiritual enough? Do we read the Bible enough? Do we pray enough? Do we, you know, and basically we are, we put our, the, the yoke of the law back on us when we were intended for grace, when we were intended for the law of liberty. And so in the last few years, I've just uh, walked into the, the grace of God, really understood relationship instead of religion, like, like Conrad just said, that's absolutely it. Uh, started to uh, uh, know, know my heavenly father as Abba. Now, for me, that was confusing because my earthly fathers painted such a bad picture of that. It was really hard. I could tell other people that God loved them, but it was really, really hard for me to, 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 to know the love of God personally that God liked me, that he was excited to be around me, that he, you know, so for years as a Christian, I tried to even hide behind a mask. Like for instance, in prayer, I would try to put on spiritual look, Luke, as if my heavenly father didn't know. He knows everything. It's so intimate. It frees us from this prison of trying to be something we're not. And uh, um, so then I, uh, after the baptism of the Holy Spirit, man, things just started happening. I started to learn how to trust God in every way finances, relationships, uh, calling on your life. And it's really been in the last couple of years that I've, I've, uh, experienced what I would, what I would call the life of victory in Christ, which is, uh, we are meant to bring, not just go to heaven one day, but to bring heaven to earth today and to live from a, we are fighting from a place of victory. We're not fighting towards victory. The victory is already ours. We are more than conquerors. And, uh, it's so beautiful. And, and since, since I really started to receive the love of God and the, and the grace of God, I've been married to a beautiful woman of God. We have a baby who's uh, 12 weeks old. You know, finally finances have, have just fallen in place instead of me constantly worrying about it and trying to manipulate things. Um, so yeah, that, so I want to pull you back real fast. I told you, I promised you in the beginning that I was going to explain suppression of the truth. There we go. With a uh, experience when I was a boy. So when I was seven, I told you that I, 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 or six or seven, I had these really traumatic encounters with my stepdad where he would lose control and break everything in the house. And uh, my brother and I, we would think that we were going to die. So I'd like pee my pants, you know, I'd run in the room. I mean, honestly, like terror, you know, terror thinking that I was going to die. Well, later in life, I'm talking maybe 26, 27 years old. The Lord gave me a memory and it was like, I could remember it as if it happened right then, but he gave it to me and I had completely forgot about it for all my teenage years, for all those years of just destroying my body and my mind. It's like I had completely forgotten about this memory and the Lord gave it back to me to show me his sovereignty throughout my life, to show me his hand of guidance throughout my life. 
And that was this moment when I was probably seven years old. Avi was in the middle of breaking everything in the house and I ran into my room and I started to shake and tremble. And when I knew I was going to die, even as a seven-year-old boy without any religious upbringing at all, I prayed to God. In my seven-year-old heart with all of me, I prayed that he would save us. I didn't call him by name. I didn't understand Jesus. I never heard anything about the Bible. But in my seven-year-old mind, I knew God instinctually. No, no one had to teach me about God. I knew God existed. And I prayed with all my heart that he would deliver my brother and I. I didn't pray in the name of Jesus. I didn't know any of that stuff. But I did pray, God, please help us. I might not even use the word God, but the memory came back. And that's why what I want to, what I want to end with is this, the fact about my conversion. I, I started out by defining atheism as someone who claims God doesn't exist. He makes the claim. That's who I was. But the truth is there are no atheists in the sense that there are no people who really don't believe in God. That's not what the word of God says. And that's not our experience. The Romans one says very clearly that we all know God exists and we suppress that truth in unrighteousness. That we're, we're without excuse for denying the God that we know. Why do we know him? Because he's made himself known, not only through creation, but internally. His eternal power and his Godhead are known. We know him relationally. Now, we might, that doesn't mean we, we know the gospel. We might not know the good news, which is why we send missionaries places, right? That God's not holding the sin of the world against them. The ministry of reconciliation is ours in Christ Jesus. It's amazing. It's really good news. But the fact, of, the fact is people know God and they refuse to worship him as God. And they worship the created thing instead of the creator. And that was me. I knew God. He delivered me from my seven-year-old tr- uh, trauma. But I was maybe mad at him. You know, I, I don't know exactly when the turning point happened, but now I, I know with all my heart that the reason I ran away from God is because I misunderstood God. I blamed God for all the mess of the devil in my life. I misunderstood who Heavenly Father was, and I wrongly associated all the stuff in my life to God, even though he was really the only source of salvation. The devil was causing havoc in my life and my family, and I blamed God for the devil's mess, which I hear that all the time in my periscopes, in my time ministering to people, is they, they wrongly associate the pain and suffering in their life to God instead of the author of lies, the father of lies. How how do you answer that now? Yeah, I would just describe, I would just describe the goodness of God. So yeah. So somebody says, what about suffering? You know, what about all the pain you see in the world? I say the suffering is a result of love. And they're like, what, what does that mean? And I say, well, love, let me, let me, let me tell you something about love. Let's say there's a, let's say that there's a girl uh, in in college and a boy really likes her. You know, he, he really wants to be with her. In fact, he loves her and he's pursuing her. So he sends her a note, a love letter. You know, he calls her on the phone. He sends her roses. He makes her a poem. If the girl says not interested, not interested, not interested, what does love do? Does love rape her? Does love make her accept him? Or does love, no matter how hard it is, let her go? And people can usually see that love, of course, lets her go. And that's, love has- That's really good. That's it's really good. It's true, man. And, and, and the problems we see in the world, guys, is a, is a result, a consequence of when we as humans rejected love himself and spit in his face. We committed treason against the king. When we took from the fruit, that wasn't a simple, uh, that, was, that was a monumental decision to place our trust, not in God, but in a, an enemy spirit, Lucifer. When we did that and the fall happened, You can trace everything bad in our experience back to this moment. And and the wages of sin is death. And of course, sin is this picture of missing the mark, placing your trust outside of God. Um, So that when I describe that to people, they, 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 they tend to like ponder it, you know, Um, but they, when, once they see, because the scriptures say that Jesus Christ is the exact imprint of the invisible God. If you want to know what God is like, the invisible spirit that we call the heavenly father, you look to the son, Jesus Christ, how he walked, how he talked, how he acted. That'll tell you what our God is like. So in Jesus, we see love personified. 
every sickness healed, every demon cast out. He came to destroy the works of the devil. He came to bring life and life abundantly. It's the thief that comes to kill, steal, or destroy. So helping people see the reality of the spiritual battle, they'll start to realize, I mean, uh, by God's grace, they start to have ears to hear and see, oh, wow, my source of salvation is actually what I've been attacking. I've been deceived by the devil. I've been duped, and I place my trust in him. And when they abandon that ship for the Ark of Salvation, then everything, you know, I don't know about you, Conrad, but when I gave my life to Christ, one of the things that came was a sound mind, right? We haven't received a spirit of fear, but a power and love and a sound mind. In my experience, the moment I gave my life to Christ, like Paul, the scales fell from my eyes spiritually, and I saw the world for the first time, and it made sense. I started to see suffering. I started to see evil for what it truly was. Confusion started to leave, and understanding and wisdom started to, to come. So. Well, guys, uh, any, any hey, questions? Well, I, I have a question for you. And, and yeah. You, uh, you kind of didn't finish. You told me, well, let's first off back up a little bit. You lost a friend, and then you got on fire to witness more. And then you said that a lot of people's lives has changed, and you didn't finish that part of your testimony. Since oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so when, I, when, I, well, when I first came on fire, this, my friend took his life uh, just this year. And it reinvigorated my, uh, my uh, passion to preach the gospel in season and out of season. But when I first got uh, saved, I preached the gospel to everybody and it destroyed a bunch of relationships. You know, like people, I was in darkness at the time, so I needed new relationships. And, uh, uh, you know, then I made that tragic mistake of being unevenly yoked, falling back into a life of sin. But it was just weird. It was just hard to do. It, it just it, it wasn't who I was. Uh, came back by the grace of God and found a body of believers. Then I, I learned how important it was to, uh, if I used to think this guys, and you might be able to relate to this. I used to think if you're a Christian, the best way you can help somebody is you link arms with them, no matter who they are, right? You link arms with them and you pull them forward. It's this picture of like, let, let's say you're in a dead church. You might think, well, the best way to fire this church back up is to link arms with the people and to just pull them forward. You might have good intentions, but what always happens is their unbelief ends up actually infecting you. So the best thing, the most loving thing you can ever do with for anybody, unbeliever or believer, the best thing you can ever do is seek Jesus Christ with all your heart. And what that means in reality is to find, uh, is to find a, a soil where you can grow in, where, where your spiritual leadership is on fire, where they're filled with the Holy Spirit where you are going to grow your most as a Christian. Now, this might seem like selfish in a way because you're worried about your spiritual walk, but the wisdom of God says it's only someone who uh, has rivers of living water flowing out of them, right? It's the, the picture of a uh, of, of ministry with the Holy Spirit is you are first filled. Only when you're filled and you're overflowing will the light of the world spill onto those around you. So what this meant is I had to strategically cut off relationships with friends and only now that God has blessed me. Now those same relationships that I thought were gone forever, they look back and say, man, you're, whatever you did was right. I just let a friend who just called, actually, I'm going to call him back in a second. This year, I led him in the Lord's prayer. He was the drummer to our band, right? The lead guitarist and singer killed himself. This guy gave his life to Jesus Christ and got born again like three months ago in my living room. Well, for years, I, when, I, when I first got saved, I tried to share the gospel with him, and he was like not having it. You know what I mean? And if I would have just stayed in life with him, the decisions he was making, the path he was on, it would not have been good for, good for either of us. But instead, I followed and chased God. I, I followed the call of Jesus. And now Jesus has showed me that he was also working in Stephen's life. Now Stephen's a, a Christian. He's a believer. You know, so... That's one example, but that that's manifested in a bunch of ways in my family as well. Both of my little brothers, uh, Judah and Benjamin, have given their life to Christ. My mom, my mom, even today, acknowledges the truth of the gospel. She acknowledges the reality of God. Her um, hang up or her her roadblock is she's thinking that if she does this, it's going to mean her husband will you know disown her. 
But the cool thing is, as Avi, I ministered him every single day. I'm just, I, 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 uh, now I'm at a place where I'm overflowing and I can be around, I can be around him without it being, without influencing me in the wrong way. And he's starting to really have, have a heart for truth. He's starting to really dig into his own Jewish faith. And I know that, hey, if you seek Yeshua, you'll find him. You'll realize it's Jesus Christ, right? If you, I'm sorry, if you seek Yahweh, you'll find him. You'll realize it's Yeshua. You'll realize if you, like uh, the, the Jews that I, that I hang out with a lot that are Christian, what they'll say is if you truly follow Moses, you'll follow Christ. Amen. Because he, he even talks about Christ in the Torah. <laughs> you know, a prophet like me. A prophet like me. A uh, couple of things. Whenever an atheist... An atheist needs an encounter to get saved, not an intellectual argument. And you, you basically were prop, pulled by the Holy Spirit. And two, before we close the recording, you're anointed. Can you pray us out? Oh, man, I appreciate it. I love that. All right. Hey, can I, can I share a poem I wrote with you guys? Amen. Okay. This is like my, my attempt at spoken word poetry. Um, I'm going to go for it here. Let me, um, let me put it over here like this so I can see it on the screen. Um, actually, I want to deliver it to you guys face to face. So, so I'm going to do this. Sorry, bear with me guys. Um, so yeah, I would say first and foremost, that arguments don't save people, but they do. They're really important. And Paul, Paul proved from the scriptures is all contextual. If you're ministering to atheists, your ministry will look a certain way. If you're ministering to a, a, a practicing a Jew of Judaism, your ministry will look a certain way. If you're ministering to a, a Muslim, again, like Jews and Muslims, they accept the Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible, as the word of God or the word of Allah. Right? Allah means God in Arabic. We shouldn't be scared of that term. right? So if you're talking to a Muslim, you go back and you prove Christ from the scriptures. You prove the Trinity from the scriptures. You can use the scriptures because it is their authority. If you're talking to a Jew, you do the same thing. You, you show the suffering servant because the Jews were looking for a Messiah. Most of them believed he'd come as a king with power only to set them free from the Roman Empire. What they weren't expecting was the Lamb of God to come and lay down his life and spill his blood as the atonement for our sins. But if you show them from the scriptures, it's clear that there's two fulfillments to the Messiah. There's the lion that they expect, but there's also the lamb. I mean, you can see this even on the tabernacle, the four faces, right? There's the lion, there's the ox, there's the lamb, or um, there's the human, and there's the eagle. Let's go through those real fast. The lion speaks of divinity. That's the king. That's the gospel of Matthew. The ox speaks of servant. So he's going to be a king, but he's also going to be a servant. That ox is, is the gospel of Mark, if you look at it, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That human face that speaks to Jesus's humanity. It's the gospel of Luke, the physician, wanted to show us he's a human, he's a man. But then the gospel of John, you guys know, that speaks to his divinity. That's the eagle. He's in the heaven soaring. So everywhere you look in the Old Testament, it's, pointing, it's, it's painting a picture of what the Messiah would do, what he would look like. So for a Jew, you might reason from the scriptures, and that's a whole that, that's awesome stuff for me. That's what I'm, I'm, I'm so fascinated with the living pictures from the Old Testament. That's a different blab, I guess. But to the atheist, you're going to want to, uh, well, what does the scripture say? The scripture says it's the fool. Psalm 14, one, the fool hath said in his heart that God doesn't exist. In the Hebrew, it's actually the fool hath said in his heart, God's not for me. Now, it also tells us how to answer the fool. Proverbs 26, four and five. Answer the fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own eyes. And then also it says, don't answer the fool according to his folly, lest you be like him. So just real quick, what that means is when, when, when the fool, with it, and that's not an intellectual uh, charge, right? That, that's not, that's not name calling. The fool is somebody who's denying what's obvious because of a moral suppression. It's a, it's a moral charge. So when the fool, the atheist says to you, prove to me God exists, and you start to give him good reasons and evidences, you're answering him. He said, he says, prove the uh, resurrection of the dead. And you start to prove it. Well, you know, there was women who reported it and there was 500 witnesses. And what you're doing is you're answering the fool according to his folly. You become like him. You've made the fool the judge over the case that is God. I'm not going to exalt anybody to judge the judge of the universe. I think it's a fool's errand. Instead, what you do is you answer the fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own eyes. Here's Mr. Atheist that just told you that you're wrong as a Christian. Wait a minute. 
where do you get wrong and right from according to atheism? You see, you just point, you point them immediately to, the, to their folly, lest they be wise and puffed up. They're, they're ready to argue geology with you. They're ready to argue astrolo astrology, astronomy. They're, they're ready to argue physics. They've studied Wikipedia for hours to justify their unbelief. But if you just meet them on a simple epistemological level, where do you even get knowledge from? Like, where do you get truth from and goodness? You destroy their argument. So uh, what I, what I, and, and, it, and by the way, guys, when first Peter 3.15 says, uh, set apart Christ as Lord in your hearts and always be ready to give, uh, the, to give a reason for the hope that's within you, where we get the word apologetics from, the apologia in the Greek. When he says that, it, it goes on to say, with gentleness and respect, because it's so important when you're destroying people's worldviews, you have to provide for them the, the, the landing that is the gospel. You know, it, you, it, it can't be if you're just trying to win arguments or beat people up with the truth. Uh, you're not you're not really representing Christ because the heart of apologetics is the salvation of the person's soul. So the heart I have, you have to be driven by a love to see people saved. And they'll know that about your apologetic. You know, they'll, that'll minister louder than your arguments will. So sorry, got off on a tangent, but I wanted to read you guys this poem. This is about what, uh, what I've come to understand is the truth. And I hope this uh, blesses you guys. So <clears throat> hold on. Oh, I'm out of water. I'll just go for it. The truth is not a teaching. It's not a worldview or a philosophy. The truth is not a doctrine or a historical fact about reality. While one plus one equals two is true, it's not the truth. The truth is not something we can wrap our minds around or figure out or reason our way to. We cannot know it by the scientific method and it cannot be logically deduced. The truth is something that our minds were simply not designed to find. It's bigger than physics, biology, and geology. It's greater than mathematics, chemistry, and astrology. Though all these things can point us to the truth, they themselves are not the truth. And if you only stay within them, you will surely never know the truth. Again, our heads may understand something to be true, but our minds were not designed to ever hold the truth. In the wisdom of God, the truth is not a way of thinking or a system of belief. Rather, the truth is a man who has come to set us free. Emmanuel, the truth himself, put on flesh and walked among us. Truth has a heart. He destroys the dark, our king, our Lord Jesus. A skeptic once cynically asked, what is truth to the man filled with grace? How ironic the question as it echoed across the room to truth's very face. You see, a lifetime of pursuing the truth with your head will leave you in the dark, but a single touch of the living Christ will eternally fill your heart. My prayer, my petition, my one request, the only thing I seek is that I might know the truth and that he might know me. Again, my prayer, my petition, my one request, the only thing I seek is that I might know the truth and that he might know me. Amen. Amen. That was awesome. The truth is a person. He's a person. I, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Amen. That's it, man. Dude, that was awesome. I mean, I just, I just, you say you're ranting. I'm like, I could, I need to take notes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I appreciate it, man. It's encouraging. So I, uh, people can follow you on Periscope. Uh, you do like surf shop apologetics. It's kind of cool, man. You'll like disappear. I'm like, Lucas has been raptured. <laughs> waiting on a customer. Dude, I don't know if you guys saw. I don't know if you guys saw it today, but I had a, I had several people come in that were born again, and I got to affirm that in their life. And then I had a, a couple of people that came in that I think God touched them. Hey, man, you're welcome, guys. Thank you for the encouragement. Yeah, and Lucas also one of the things he does is if, if you're dealing with atheists in your family or in, you know just in your life, he really gives solid ways how to deal with an atheist as a believer it's on your Periscope. And you have some teachings on YouTube that I need to dive into. They look pretty awesome, right? Uh, uh, so one bit of uh, uh, one bit of pre-warning for my teachings on atheists uh, are on YouTube. I'm sorry, a lot of it has to do with atheism. But I like, for instance, I have this five-part video called "Our Story," and, and it's going to walk you through uh, the Word of God, what the Word of God says about things like what is the problem, like why are we suffering. Um, it's going to walk you through uh, the, the story of, uh, of the Old Testament, the living pictures. It's going to walk you through uh, the man of grace, Jesus Christ, and, of course, what it means to be born again. Uh, but one, one caveat or, or something I just want to bring up is I teach, I teach middle school kids 
So I made all of those videos. I think they're very valuable for anybody, but I made them um, with middle schoolers in mind. So I went kind of slow. I made sure to define my terms. So for some of you guys, it might be a little uh, dry, but it's still, I think it's still valuable. And, and uh, you know, I'd love your feedback, of course, but, um, but I, I, I have considered making some more adult content only, but um, I don't know about you guys, but some, it, as long as it's anointed and as long as the word of God's in it, the stuff made for kids still blesses me. So you can watch a really good veggie tales and be like, Whoa, amen. That was awesome. So, I love, I love veggie tales. Yeah, me too. <laughs> All right, pray, pray us out, and I'll stop the recording, and if people want to ask questions, it would be awesome. So. All right, cool, guys. I, I appreciate it. Father, we just thank you. We come before your throne of grace by the blood of Jesus Christ, not our own strength, but we just come before you humbly uh, uh, just by, uh, uh, by your blood alone, Jesus, with full assurance of faith, knowing that we can enter the secret place by a new and a living way. Uh, Lord, we just, we worship you right now. We bring you uh, glory and honor. We, we long to please you. We, in fact, we pray, Lord, I pray for all of my brothers and sisters in here. And I know that they're going to amen this, that the one thing we seek, the one thing that we ask for is to dwell in the house of the Lord forever, to be, uh, to be with you, to know you. Father, I pray right now for an anointing uh, in Conrad's ministry, Lord, of boldness and just compassion, Lord, that you would increase his territory, that you'd use his ministry, uh, that, that is ultimately your ministry, that you use it for your glory and for your namesake. I pray for everyone listening, Lord, that's here, that's joined us. I pray that you would uh, give them, grant them more, uh, the, the spirit of wisdom and revelation, the knowledge of you, more awareness of who they are, their identity in Christ, sonship, daughtership, the fact that you are their Abba Father, Lord. That, uh, that we are we don't come to you as slaves. We don't come to you uh, dirty, but we've already been cleaned. It's past tense. It is finished. So I just pray, Father, right now that any shame or guilt or condemnation would go right now in Jesus' name, that that would be replaced with the truth about their identity, that they are righteous, the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus, that they are forever cleansed and sanctified, that they are pure and holy, set apart, uh, in Christ, seated in heavenly places. So Father, I just thank you so much for this time. I thank you that we get to come together and fellowship in the light and, and rejoice and talk about uh, our testimonies, the work that you've done. May you receive all the glory for what's said here tonight, Lord, and may everyone listening, may they receive uh, just uh, more and more of you, Father. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks for sharing your testimony with Conrad Rocks. I appreciate it, dude. It was awesome. Oh man, thanks so much for having me, bro. I'm so uh, I'm, it's a privilege, and uh, I love what you're doing. I support you totally. So hopefully, uh, some of my Periscope friends will will follow uh, Conrad because man, this guy is uh, the, the word of the testimony, man. It's so.